there's always a better way to do what you're doing right now. Um, <laughs> so be grateful. Now they're just like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to do, right? And I was like, no, programmatic is where my heart is. <laughs> Amen. Hey. Welcome to another episode of the Pergamatic Digest podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Parker. We have a fellow French-speaking guest, but we'll make it in English for y'all. Don't worry. His name is Marc Poirier from We Are Clever. Marc, how are you doing today? Welcome to the podcast. Hey, great. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm doing well. We're excited to talk to Marc because we're going to talk about agency trading does, how to get started in this field. We're going to talk about his journey. We're really going to understand like how the success of putting people's first and putting the value of a human over anything else, which I think we are clever at doing a great job at. Um, but before we get into today's conversation, Mark, can you please introduce yourself to us? Let us know who you are, how you got to where you are now. That's very much like this. Is, I think it's an interesting story and we would love to hear it. So tell us a little bit about you before we start the, the official interview. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been in the uh, digital advertising, digital marketing space uh, since the late 90s. So I'm not, I'm not a young pup <laughs> I've been, uh, and, and I'm an entrepreneur. So I've, I've built businesses and uh, before Clever, the business was Acquizio. It was a software to help marketers manage uh, their Google Ads accounts. Yeah. And we had a customer base that spanned the globe, uh, very niche with the world of uh, agencies. And also with the, uh, the, the, the companies that help S very small businesses. So lots of yellow page companies and so on. So the, one of the sort of niche uh, uh, areas where Quizio was very successful. Um, and we ran that business for, I was founder, co-founder and CEO there for, uh, we, we, we started in 2003, just to tell you, and sold it in 2017 to web.com. Um, yeah, so it was a, a pretty long journey of trying to, well, build software to provide value to search marketers, but also to, to understand what, what they wanted. We had to spend time with them, spend time with agency executives at trade shows. We did lots of, lots of events, lots of trade shows, lots of face to face. Yeah. Meetings. And, uh, of course, talking to our clients as well. It's where we learned what needs to happen what are, where their minds are at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and it, it guide us it guided our, our roadmap the entire time you know just uh, being close to prospects and clients is really what uh made us successful i think i think mark is explaining in the most diplomatic and graceful way how they were really great at listening to their clients challenges thing as an opportunity to improve and responding to that challenge with a solution. <clears throat> I think it's a very, very graceful and humble way to say, we listen and then we activate it on it, which is why I'm so excited to talk to y'all because I think it's it's a very, very interesting, like we we claim as marketers that we do, but we don't always do it. Um, so we'll definitely get a little bit more about like the best practices there and how you develop that relationship with clients. Um, but when every guest comes on the podcast, I like to ask um, their own definition of programmatic advertising to a five-year-old. So if you had to explain to a five-year-old what you do on your day-to-day, -day, how would you tell that five-year-old? What would you tell them? No, I, tell, I, I would tell them that we help... Uh, advertisers so companies who buy ads right because we see the ads and so people buy them uh, we help them buy the right ads and pay the right price and uh, try to help them be as successful as they can mm, that's really uh that's really straightforward <laughs> a lot of people fluff yeah. it up but you're like it's, it is what it is we do what we do <laughs> i love it um mm -hmm. so talking about helping people uh, place ads can you tell us what clever does um, and then I'd love to understand, like, your projections for how the industry is moving, especially with 
recruiting, sourcing, staff augmentation and things like that. But like, give us your good, like, well, I clever, we do this and this, this way. Okay, well, maybe first, like the, the origin of the company. Ooh, um, that would be good, a good start, yeah. Yeah, it was rooted in, in uh, at Aquizio, actually. Ooh, you know, okay. I, we we had ambition <laughs> to, build, to build our own DSP in 2010. I want to say about that time. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that was triggered by a meeting with uh, Jeff Green, who's yeah, from the trade desk, founder and CEO at the trade desk. But at the mm -hmm. time, he, he was actually he was the same thing, but he didn't have, they didn't have any clients yet. And his mm -hmm. brother was one of our clients, and he's really the one that sort of. Um, opened my eyes to the opportunity of advertising outside of Google. Because yes. at the time, there was no Facebook, really. Uh, no Facebook ads, or if there were, uh, I don't recall. There was a Facebook exchange that came along. I remember that. But anyway, um, so th so we, we spent a lot of time sort of debating whether or not we should build our own or partner with uh, IP on web or maybe uh, AppNexus at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're now or Microsoft or like there are companies who build infrastructure for rent, right? You can just sort of right. work with them and save a lot of time and energy okay. and money. And uh, or should we build our own or should we um, maybe uh, buy a company? You know, mm -hmm. so through that process, we met a lot of the different players, different even on the data side, and and it it opened yeah, it just opened my eyes to the the opportunity that's out there and what people outside of search. Uh, are doing for ads, digital mm -hmm. ads. So we we ended up doing none of these things because of <laughs> pressure okay. from our board. You know, our, our investors and board of directors wanted us to to build uh, to continue to innovate on the search, and uh, we had limited means. We had, of course, we had money, right. but we didn't have unlimited amounts of money or resources. So we it's a big investment. Yeah. Technology ad tech investment. Yeah. It's a significant you know move. And when you, to start with, uh, we're going to build a DSP. We had our own roadmap to add this. It's, a, it's an entire company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So too risky. And so we decided to um, to take the the route of just using, and this is uh, prompted by Jeff. This is, this is partner uh, and mm -hmm. uh, some, some integration, you know, where search data would be available for clients, mm -hmm. build audiences from their, the clicks they get on their, their mm -hmm. campaigns. And then um, you run a managed service, you know, just it's help them. And and yeah, it turned out that the the managed service component was uh, something that worked, you know, like clients enjoyed it. They uh, We sold some, but it was never wow. very strategic for the company. You know, it was something we needed to do, um, but we never put a lot of emphasis on selling it. So what ended up happening is our existing client base we had some penetration in there. And so we built a, you know, maybe 20 people, 15, 20 people were working in that department and mm -hmm. it stayed there, you know, it stayed like that for, for many years. Mm -hmm. But we, what happens when you have that team, that core group of people is they develop strong expertise. They become really, really uh, experienced, you know, they, they make all the mistakes and so on. So um, in 2019, web.com had acquired a quiz two years before. Mm -hmm. In two thousand, at the end of two thousand nineteen, they sold um, uh, they sold the Aquizio Trading Desk. That component. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, they sold that to. I'm not going to name them, but a, a vendor. Like right. An, okay. And um, and they and they laid off the entire team <laughs> immediately because they had their own. I assume that's why you know they had their own. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. So, yeah, but that, it's a service that you're selling. So for me, it was an opportunity, you know, like I left maybe a year before, uh, two years before, two years before. Right. You sold the company and, and left. Okay. And then, and then I see all these resources that are just out of work in an industry that's on fire and where there's so much we can do. So I, you know, I called uh, Vincent, my uh, co-founder. Mm hmm and we we talked we'd been talking about doing something anyway yeah, yeah, and yeah. This is the opportunity you know we we built we built the business on uh, the fact that we had like some really strong staff yeah build roles in trading account management and strategy and sales day one you know we knew th these were the key components mm -hmm. and we had a strong management team i mean 
Wow, that's really cool. We had Vincent, but we're, we're, we knew we're, uh, we knew what to do, I guess, at this stage. So we we just did it. We just spun up the company, secured a few engagements, and <clears throat> and built the business. So it's been uh, a little more than two years now. That the company. Wow, is, uh, that's really cool. Well, and, and what it is, but you asked me what it is. It's it's um, an independent uh, trading desk. Yeah. Okay. Focused on helping the mid market U.S. agency. Mm -hmm. Um, make sense of programmatic and use programmatic and sell programmatic and say yes, you know, because their clients ask them all the time and yeah. they usually say no because uh, all they know is ad roll or whatever, you know, they use like <laughs> the solution, yeah. which is great, that's fine, but that's it only takes you so far. You'll that's you'll true. be able to take some retargeting budgets with that, but when the real money's at the table, the TV money's here, you're not, yeah, <laughs> you can't say that. I mean, maybe you can, I don't know, but that's it. So, so that's. That's the opportunity for us is to help those mid-market guys. They're, if, if I draw a picture, it's a, they're like 50, 60, 70 employees. Mm -hmm. they've, been, they, they've been around for 15, 20 years, solid book of clients, very yeah. loyal. And, and their clients want to work the top of the funnel and Facebook's not been that great. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, they're exploring. So we, we come in and provide like a, uh, because we're agnostic, we don't, you know, we're not a business that we do build tech, but it's to help our traders. Mm -hmm. We use everything that's out there. We, we use multiple DSPs and data partners and uh, DCO partners and so on, you know? So we, we, mm -hmm. we can put together a solution that fits the need of the client rather than try to make them use our technology because we believe in it strongly that, that we want them to. <laughs> and you work with uh, agencies and brands, correct? Yeah, mostly agencies, but yeah, we have a few uh, large brands as well. So help me clarify the difference between like maybe staff augmentation and like an agency trading desk. Do you get that? That questions often like do you get yeah, clients no, that ask you like hey what's the difference like how do you address this question i'm very curious yeah they don't they don't ask us the question we're just uh we just encounter it like when we talk to clients yeah. that we serve them usually they have larger budgets and they, they will they will say we'd like to have someone in-house to manage the relationship with you like we don't want like three traders and a strategist and like they don't want to build a team Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they want to have some expertise in house you know so they, so we've we've done it well tw twice but once where we actually sourced the the person for them and gotcha it, it's it but we're just sort of figuring our way through that you know it's not that's not what we're we're not positioning to to do staff augmentation mm -hmm. we are part of their team you know we're in their slack or they're in ours or whatever uh, with yeah. all our clients but but it's their you know their the the positioning is very much your you know we we bring solutions to you we we provide the media and the, the talent and the strategy and so yeah, on. Yeah, it seems like it's like uh, we take over most of your stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like a smooth, easy, easy, easy way to like transition. And I have had clients like for in the past just saying like you know we don't we don't want to grow internally we just want to find the right partners and so they'll hire me as consultant have you worked with this have you worked with that what do you think about this type of you know partnership and this always goes back to that well staff augmentation you bring the person in-house but an agency trading desk you build the team in-house but it's still like they're going to take care of everything and there's this and this that so i think yeah, there's, cool. there's pros and cons to both because I can tell of you course. hiring people means you need to manage them. You need to have more than yeah. one. You need vacation. They need time off. So you, need <laughs> you need to vacation. Right, so quickly, the cost <laughs> rise. And then someone needs to manage them. You don't have someone that knows the space. You need to hire a manager. Yeah. I got three people. Yeah. You're a strategy person, probably. If you're if you're investing that much, then now yeah. you got four people. I don't know. You can see where this goes, right? So quickly, it's it, and it depends. You know, for some companies, it doesn't matter. They're investing a let's yeah. say a million dollars a month to spend another, uh, you know, 50,000 doesn't, they're very comfortable doing that, but it's not for everybody. And it's, it's not just the cost. It's the, the headache of finding that talent and keeping them. 
very difficult. I, I like that because... We're challenges, but we're good at it. <laughs> well, you know, when you said you went to to grab all that team that was laid off, what I imagined was you on a boat. You, I don't know if you've seen this uh, meme, <laughs> but it's the it's somebody on a boat and then the manager, like the, the team is drowning and the manager is like, good job, giving them a high five and keep <laughs> moving. But for you, I imagine you grabbing their hand and pulling them like Jesus did with Tom and Peter, you know, pulling them onto the boat like, Come on, I got you. <laughs> I think they were happy. Like, yeah, I think they were that's happy. the only thing I can think of. I think it's really great. But also, like, if you, it says a lot about your leadership style, so it is all about your mission and values. Because I've worked with agency trading desks before, I've worked with ad agencies, you know, the marketing agencies. And the number one reason why I left, I know, was because of leadership, period. And I, I appreciate what you said because. It's not as, it's not as, you know, we use excuses as reason nowadays to not make, go above that extra, go above and beyond for our people, for our team. And then we lose, ex we lose great talent like this. Like you said, that whole team was expert and they, what, what you mean to say one person on that team was not able to move onto your new company? You know what I mean? But anyway, yeah, so but if just, they have their reasons, you know, I don't, I'm not, of course, there's always a reason, but like, if there's nobody on the team, like this, they raise one eyebrow, at least like yeah. one eyebrow. I'm like, mm, sure. no. it's a, it's a large, it's a large programmatic player in the mid market, I guess you could right. say. And they, they have a lot of people, maybe too many, you know, it's, it's like, I'm, maybe, I know maybe. what it's like to manage a big company too. I know what it's like to manage a small one. <laughs> Different small pressure, you know, so we're, you we're have very... to make decisions you have to make decisions yeah well i appreciate on behalf of those people i definitely appreciate you doing that hi did you know that at ellen parker consulting we now offer an accelerator program where we attract recruit and train future marketers and their training include a six weeks program where they cover programmatic landscape um, industry important industry trends the differences between targeting placement and targeting mix and their best practices, including optimization and reporting hacks. Um, and they're able to set up, manage, and monitor a campaign, a demo campaign in the trade desk. Everything, including audience selection, inventory optimization, SPO, creative upload, brand safety, you name it. They're able to do it at the end of the six weeks program. So if you are part of the 90% of employers struggling to find a skilled candidate today and not willing to spend $14,900 on a bad hire, according to Zipia, give us a call. Let's discuss which one of our five to 10 juniors available every month is the perfect fit for your team. Clients who have hired our juniors have shared that we were able to help them save one to two months on boarding with those juniors. Give us a call right now and let's discuss the solution with you. So now talk to us about like where, how, how we're growing, like based on everything happening in, in the industry, like what are some of the challenges you might be facing, not as a company only, but with clients, a lot of clients are coming back asking these questions and how are yeah. you addressing them? Like, what's like a one, one question to come up, like the top of my mind or something that happened recently where you're like, well, we had this challenge and this is for how we were able to help. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of challenges. I mean, because they're all different and we serve a, a vast array of sort of types of companies and also size of budgets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it really depends, yeah. Um, yeah, so, it, so for, for some, for many that are in the sort of small, like say 10 to 30,000 per month, mm -hmm. the big stretch for a lot of these companies to do that, they're, then they really believe it's gonna save them. <laughs> Or that is going to, they're going to see short-term measurable impact on mm -hmm. like direct sales, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and it's it's that discussion around measurement, attribution, identity. It's it's difficult because different people are ready or not ready to hear this. <laughs> but you know, we're working the top of the funnel. They're mm -hmm. they're. They, always say yes we're doing awareness and branding we're trying to reach hearts and minds and mm -hmm. okay good 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 and then you know within a couple and this is this is not all the time obviously but you're right, asking right. this is the one scenario the yeah what some of the challenges are 
you know, they, they expect to see a reflection of what they see in Google ads through Google. Oh, Analytics. Uh, and of course one. the ad impressions are very ethereal, you know, it's very out there, but it's not, people saw it. It's the right, you know, we have the reach of frequency, right? We targeted the right people. You got some view through conversions. They don't want to believe that. So it's, it's, uh, there's a challenge there and it's, it's not them, you know, it's just on the industry's changing so quickly. There's so many different ways to measure success. And depending on budgets, it's not possible to do like st brand lift studies and stuff like that sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, yeah, I think there's a evangelizing to be done. Like just yeah, change more people. education. Yeah, the old yeah. marketing, you know, like old advertising from the early 1900s, you know, they, they just did it. They just ran ads on TV and, and radio. And if you look at the world's biggest brands, of course, they have discipline around measurement and so on. Right. But it's not the first consumption. They, they know what they need to do and they mm -hmm. do it and they're, they're very successful. So I, I think trying to shift their minds to, uh, okay, you're, this is not just retargeting. And they, I mean, you can, but the, the real mm -hmm. opportunity is in growing your brand equity, growing your, the, your, the, your presence in people's hearts and minds. Like you, mm -hmm. that's what you need to do. You know, if you, think that you can just harvest the bottom of the funnel, the people searching for what you sell, you're missing, <laughs> probably missing, missing opportunities. part of the opportunity. Yeah. So it's, it's having those conversations and finding ways to have them um, and to avoid like falling back to the sort of last click attribution model that search uh, sort of brought to yeah, the we world. We got used to it, but so we got comfortable with it because of search. Um, I like to, during our introduction call, I like to, uh, <clears throat> I remember what you said, you were like, <laughs> you're like, well, you know, a lot of people focus on give, give search its flowers because it's, you know, a bottom of the funnel converter and things like that. But a funnel has a bottom a mid and a top, <laughs> you know, you got to remember the top, the, the, the other <laughs> two because the bottom doesn't make the full funnel. And I still, I use this from that day. I think the intro call was what a month ago, I think, <laughs> but I use it. I'm like, well, Mark told me that a funnel has a few parts you can't only focus on this because very often when i'm like even in the community we have a community with other traders ad ops and they always come back and say like oh we were asked to shift some budget from programmatic into social because in social we can i don't know it's e-commerce we can track the shopify orders and there's like um we can really measure success there versus in programmatic advertising our cpa or it's, it's 3x you know the social cp and things like that and i i always i always tell them like you know it's a lot of education like you said that has to happen internally and to the client and obviously as as marketers we want to do what's best for the brand um but again you cannot like cut off an arm that is so that can be so successful towards the other arm you have to really like look at your your numbers you have to continue testing you have to understand that each like you said each of those channels are measuring so differently we cannot compare apples to apples we cannot it, it scares me Perfect. when when you know when we have a same like i don't know kpi go in search that's in social and as in programmatic i'm always like if your search <laughs> if your search right. goal is i don't know three dollar cpa or cpc I can give you $3 CPCs in programmatic, but it's not how to best use this technology. You can use it so many other ways, right? And so mm -hmm. always like, I always scringe a little bit like, yeah, we can have an objective goal. Like overall, we want to do X. ROAS revenue goal is this. And then based on those channels, that's when you have to allocate and update and optimize. So it's, it's always like overall, or like I hate the cumulative KPI should be around X. Like what? No, that this it's just no, it's not helping anybody. It's not but understand <laughs> why um, you know, a CMO who's not in the platform would be like, okay, so I'm spending X amount of dollars in budget. Mm. Why can you tell me real quick what should I know? And so I understand why some of those numbers can come, you know, kind of mixed together. But when you go down to that actual technology or channel, like please, y'all, yeah, y'all gotta. You got to make your effort to just really direct the client. And I know sometimes it's out of our decisions, right? Yeah. Sometimes you direct sometimes the client you... and nothing happens. <laughs> when you talk to them, they'll tell mm -hmm. you the goal 
is brand awareness and yeah this, yeah 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 so then it's up to us to say okay then we're gonna measure that yeah. that's what the business is for mm -hmm. and for this these campaigns here's the objectives we're gonna have they're gonna be measured in terms of reach and frequency and so on yeah, that's yeah. You told me, <laughs> right so and maybe we'll do a brand lift study and maybe we'll, we'll do right. these things if the money's there but that's what the goal is so that and then I think it really helps to to really finish the conversation properly before you start mm -hmm. around manage the expectations around okay this is what we've agreed upon and that's that's what we're going to do and yeah those there are maybe say 10 percent of your budgets for retargeting and so on fine they can have whatever whatever uh, uh cpa target we agree upon but not everything you know like let's just be clear on that and i, th I think that goes a long way you know it's more it's not like I studied it, but I, I know it. Like we see it every day, like the, the, yeah. uh, the discussions and the direction they go. We see it immediately when something's going to go south and we, you know, hopefully always course correct before it's too late. Yeah. So they're going to understand can, what they're buying. Yeah. You can, you can start seeing some signs where, when a client is asking specific questions, like, oh, oh, okay. So what does that really mean? So why is, especially when they ask, why, why are we seeing this in search, but not in programmatic? Or why are we seeing this in programmatic, but not in, I don't know, social or email marketing, whatever. When they start comparing, that's when you're like, okay, they are one, it's our role to educate and sometimes it's repetitive. But if, if the client is asking the same question multiple times, you may not be great at explaining. So it's up to you to really like challenge yourself to do better. Okay, don't just be like, oh, this client is just not comprehending me. No, you should be able to use your expertise and really demystify it. And you don't have to dumb it down. I don't think a client is dumb, but you got to demystify it and translate it in a language that they can understand because they have so much more to going on. And that's why we are hired for, you know, to help them understand what's happening in the back end. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you. And also, I like the fact that you pointed out with expectation. Like expectation are also not a set in it, forget it, but it's also nice to have as close as the right expectation set at first. And then to check in on those expectations and to make sure that, hey, we discussed this. Are you still on board with this? Because sometimes clients' expectation will change and we're still right here. Right? <laughs> and so we got we to gotta stay ahead of this, but there's no secret sauce. It's not magical. Not like a black box. You just gotta be, you just gotta make the effort to look up like and pay attention and really like listen to to what's happening. You know, it's bigger than just what you do sometimes. Yeah. I think also we're maybe not putting enough uh as an industry mm -hmm. emphasis on the importance of uh people mm. versus tech. You know, I think we've been selling tech. I I have <laughs> for <laughs> forever. Um, but I I it's commoditized completely let's face it like the, the yeah there's the differences between dsp a b c d e are uh much less than their commonalities you know they're the same basically with small differences of course i i know that they're not exactly the same but they serve the same purpose they everybody has access to pretty much the same inventory the same audiences the same uh, features the same yes so, yes for me, um, that's why we didn't say, oh, let's just get married with, uh, I don't know, DB360, the trade mm -hmm. desk, or whoever, you know, we, we don't really care. <laughs> we don't really care. It's like we have our favorites, you know, we, of course, we right. love them because we spent so thousands and thousands of hours playing with that and talking, building relations. Yeah. So, but also, you know, DB has its place and, yeah. and, and and others like Xander and so on and and mm -hmm. and uh, Samsung DSB and the, every there's specialists and we want to stay open but the the point is that the difference is having people who who are passionate who care hopefully have a lot of experience mm -hmm. and and uh, to train them you know like if they if they're because not everybody has you know seven eight years experience training oh no 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 start managing teams and so on so yeah. so you have to be realistic with that too but training people properly and, and giving them the right support. And for us, it's um, in our hiring plans, you, it's mm -hmm. always reflected. The minute, you know, there's always more traders and strategists than sales and, you know, and account management, always. And I hope it stays like that uh, because we're selling a service, you know? So if you, you start having, I don't know, let's say 50% uh, <laughs> of the company is in sales. Yeah. Because it's a service, don't get me wrong. It's okay yeah, if you're no. 
your no, no, no. As agency you. trading desk, yeah, you got to be able to fulfill your Our service more than anything else. Yeah, like yeah. humans, that we need the humans to do the job and serve people properly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah we're, we're getting really good at recruiting and training mm -hmm. creators. <laughs> That's right. really great because that's one of the reasons why we created our program. It's called the Reach and Frequency. And we train like career pivoters, corporate professional that want to just pivot into programmatic. We teach them, we train them, we get them initiated with the world of programmatic. And when we train them on like the most basic and fundamentals needs that a trader has, because my experience is trading. I started as a trader and then built team of trader and director trading, things like that. And so the program is is tailored for that. And the reason why it was created is because there's not a lot of companies like Clever that is willing to invest, right, in their people as much. Now I'm getting a lot of requests for, we need a senior with this experience, but they're not willing to be taking care of that senior from a salary perspective, from benefit perspective, as you should. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we want seniors and treat them like juniors. Okay. And then are, you know, surprised that things are not working out. But uh, I love the fact that uh, you said it starts with like the onboarding process. Like it's, I don't think we have a scarce, like a talent scarcity. I just think most companies have an onboarding challenge because we expect the person to pick up within a certain amount and then we stop after three, four months, we stop like they're on their own, go live your best life, figure it out on your own. And that's not how it's supposed to be. Whether the person has seven years experience or seven month experience, it still has to look, a roadmap needs to be implemented at least up to the year. Now we may not be at, as hands-on for like a senior, but for like somebody like a junior is so important because once you get through that first hump, right? And then you build enough confidence, then the person will become a little bit more independent, self-sufficient, self-starter, things that we want them to have on day one. And so that's like always been like, it's always been a, a, a conversation battle almost with <laughs> with some of the hiring manager that, that ask us for help. Like, can you help us find juniors here and there? And also I think we expect juniors to know at least like a year experience. And I'm like, no, usually juniors don't know anything, but maybe up to three months. Yeah. They're like coordinators. So, we, we, yeah. Very coordinators. That's yeah, a perfect thing. Yeah. The common path is you come in and you support the traders who are exactly. more. Exactly. And then after six months, at least maybe a yeah. year, you know, they, depending, different people are different, but some, some kind of graduate, you know, they, we give them, one or two accounts that we feel are low risk. Exactly. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they grow, but yeah, yeah, we, yeah. but we do hire seniors too. Well, but yeah, they are, yeah, that's an important point. Like a senior trader is like um, two to three times the salary of a junior. <laughs> so it, it's not the same thing. Yeah. It's not the same thing, but that senior is able to, to really like manage that junior or a handful of junior, let's say, because then those juniors learn from that senior. And you're right. Most traders that I've hired from scratch were up to speed within six months. Because just like what you said, the first three months is very like, who are we? Why are you here? <laughs> What's programmatic? Spell with two M's, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, but after that three month mark, you, you dive, you let them dive into like something like you said, task base coordination of an account and after that they have like their first account but the senior is there the whole time just managing overviewing verifying but trusting right and within six months they're they're good they can start taking up a little bit more accounts on their own and of course again there's always a leader behind the scenes just helping them because like, you cannot let them you know like a baby will walk find their first what six months like my daughter she went from walking to jumping but like she started, but for the first few steps that she had, we were behind and sometimes we're still behind her, but she's three and she runs really fast, you know? So you still have to really, like you trust them enough, but there's times where you can see, oh, well, let me get closer and make sure that, you know, she knows she's safe or not safe. Um, so I'm not comparing <laughs> what we do to a, a baby growing or a toddler, but, but sometimes that's, that's, it is, it is That's what it also is. where we, we build tech there too. You know, when we say we build tech, it's not customer facing stuff, but that's a good example. Mm -hmm. Having the correct dashboards to show you mm. each trader's portfolio of clients and how the performance is fluctuating day over day, week over week, month over month. 
um, how they perform on average versus others, their level of activity in the account, all this stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, this is the type of tech we build. Mm, uh, that's cool. Others, but that's just a good example, very operational um, tech that allows their manager and their manager's managers and me and Vincent yeah. to see, you know, how things are going really. <laughs> and then yeah. we can see where people need help. And it, it, it just, it's just so helpful. But the, what you're describing to us is progress, progress. You're measuring progress of those people and you're understanding like people may not progress at, at the same, you know, speed and that is okay. Okay. Um, but you're managing and looking at that bar and making sure that it keeps moving. I don't care if it moves 1% every day or every month, but it keeps moving. And that's, that's a win, especially in this industry. And the more you let your people know, like, hey, I know there's a lot of learning right now. We do have expectation for you, but you're not alone. We got you. Okay. And here's other people you can look up to that's going to help you get to that, to that where you're supposed to. And if you're not getting to where you're supposed to, what happened? How can we make it happen? You know? Um, and sometimes it really does not work. But like I said, I have not met a trader that really was not qualified to, to continue being a trader. I have met traders that wanted to be account managers, you know? So after oh, a few wow. months, yeah. they're like, you know, I really like trading, but I want to be more client facing. And so we, you know, we kind of mold them into an account coordinator and then they move on and they're really successful over there. And because they understand what a trader is about, it makes them even better account managers. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I've it's really funny been... because our, our head of uh, ad ops. Yeah. When she meets these people, she's better now. But in the beginning, she was like, uh, I think they want to be an account manager. <laughs> <laughs> and then me and the, the rest of the team are like, and? <laughs> so we need those too, you know? So but she's yeah. like, yeah, but I'm hiring someone for me right now. Like, okay, well, <laughs> we can start, we yeah, can yeah. start an ad ops. And then if they really want to move over, we'll need them anyway. So it's no problem. Yeah. And then, you know, that's the beauty. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. Because I've met traders that wanted to be data analytics and analytics and just building dashboard and helping optimize and, and looking at insight. But they started as traders, but within a year, a year and a half, they were like, no, I really just want to work more in Tableau. Right. And so they got moved. And so, like I said, I think it's the beauty of, of really investing and putting, putting people first. And that's why I was super excited to have you on, on the podcast, because I really wanted to, to people to hear it but also like to really applaud you. Cause I think that's what, that's the success of our industry. Now the people I know like tech is sexy, data is sexy, but if you don't got a people to help you manage this data and understand the tech or implement or execute, you don't, you know, it's almost like you have this beautiful product that you can't really maximize. And so, but we have to make a better effort and, um, I appreciate that. So before we go, as we get into this closing segment, I want us to, I want you to leave us with like a word of wisdom. I like to ask the people, um, the guests that are coming on the podcast, what is something you learn now? Okay. That you've gone really good at now that you wish you knew when you first started, like, what would you tell your freshman self? <laughs> I would say, uh, and I, I've learned this through executive coaching. Yeah. But it's to listen more and talk mm. less. That is so good. <laughs> that is so good. Why? <laughs> that's, that's for me. This is something that you asked me this question, and <laughs> that's the first thing that popped into my mind. I, mean, I can tell you probably 12 things, but that, that stayed with me, and it was a really good lesson, and it paid off. I mean, it's. I, I like that. I like that. Sometimes there's more wisdom that's acquired in just listening. So, well, thank you so much for dropping by. If anybody needs to reach out to you, how can they do that? Uh, well, you can reach me at uh, Mark, M-A-R-C, at beclever.com. So B-E-K-L-E-V-E-R.com. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I'm on Twitter at Mark Poirier, M-A-R-C, P-A-Y-R-I-E-R. On LinkedIn, I'm Mark Poirier. And, uh, <laughs> and all of Max's information is going to be in the video description on YouTube or in podcast show notes. And um, we'll be posting a few things also on on um, on LinkedIn, on social media, and our newsletter. So if you, you want to go back to like clever, just remember it's written with a K and they're the only one out there with that. So it's really easy to find them. But also do connect with Mark and let him know like, if you have any follow-up questions, if you have any, 
any questions about what was discussed today, I think he's a great resource and we really thank you for being part of the industry. Um, I think you're a great, a great person to look up to and thank you. We're honored that you, you drop by, you know? I'm honored to be here. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye-bye.